Uh, good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Renee Kanaki Jefferson to discuss shortlisted women in the shadows of the Supreme Court. She'll be in conversation this evening with Eleanor Jordan. Uh, you heard me as you entered, but just one more time, uh, you will remain muted throughout the event and will be unable to mute yourself. Speaker view is probably the ideal viewing experience for the event. And we just ask that you have your video off for the remainder of the event. We'll also have time for a Q&A following Eleanor and Renee's conversation. Um, you can submit questions that you might like to ask to me privately at any time during the event. Otherwise, the chat is closed. And I'll come back on at the end of the event to ask those questions uh, on your behalf. As a reminder, you can purchase shortlisted on our website. And I'll also include a link in the chat. And if you're watching later on YouTube, there is a link in the description below to purchase directly from Lirati. Uh, you can shop for more books at LiratiBookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance uh, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where in the country or the world you may be tuning in from. Uh, so without further ado, Renee Jefferson is professor of law and holds the Joanne and Larry Doherty Chair in Legal Ethics at the University of Houston Law Center, formerly the Foster Swift Professor of Legal Ethics and co-director of the Frank J. Kelly Institute of Ethics and the Legal Profession at Michigan State University College of Law. She was appointed to the Michigan State University Board of Trustees in 2019. Eleanor Jordan is the Senior Program Manager for the Survivor Law Clinic at the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence which seeks to transform the criminal justice process through victim rights representation. Before coming out, becoming a lawyer, Eleanor worked in El Salvador and Washington DC on human rights and gender equal equity issues. Please use your uh, Zoom clap reaction function to <laughs> join me in welcoming Renee and Eleanor to Literati virtually. Oh, that's a fun thing. Thank you for prompting that. <laughs> um, it does definitely take the um, sort of separation out of this experience. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name obviously is Eleanor Jordan and I'm just so, I was so thrilled, um, Renee, when you offered to have me come and join you for this discussion. And I just wanted to say one of the reasons that I was so pr privileged is that I just, it makes me think back to the times that I had sitting in both your and your co-author Hannah Brenner's classrooms back in law school and the chances I had to learn from you and see you as an example as I was coming, coming up as an attorney and becoming um, the kind of lawyer that I wanted to be. And you've always been so supportive throughout my career. Um, just every time that uh, I was mulling something or considering something, it's always felt like um, you really made me feel like I could go to the next level and kind of take it to maybe, um, to put it in words of this amazing book from shortlisted to selected kind of thing. <laughs> and so I just appreciate you so much. And so it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and so I would love it if you could just start us off by telling us a little bit about the story of the book, because I think um, the story of you and Professor Brenner working together um, is really a special one. And I wondered if you could start us off with that. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thanks to Literati and uh, thanks to you for joining me in this conversation. And of course, the, the story of this book begins in many ways back when you were in my classroom and when you were in Hannah's classroom and also when you were editor in chief at the Michigan State Law Review and with us organized a phenomenal symposium on gender and the legal profession's pipeline to power. And it's from that symposium that seeds were planted for this book. And in fact, and so now everyone's gonna to have to think back about a decade ago or so, uh, the seeds that were planted included media coverage of two Supreme Court nominees, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor, when then President Obama dared to nominate not just one, but two uh, in succession. And we, 
we noticed that the media was really fixated on their appearance and their status as women, as single women, not having children, in a way that the coverage hadn't been like that when President Bush had appointed John Roberts and uh, Samuel Alito just a few years before. So we created a media study. And the media study, we looked at every article written in the New York Times and the Washington Post from the early 1970s through the confirmations of Kagan and Sotomayor. And perhaps not surprisingly, it confirmed what we had been observing anecdotally. The media focuses more on gender qualities for female nominees. We coded for over 40 different variables and confirmed what our instincts had shown us. But as academics, we didn't want to just speculate. And we, we thought that perhaps we could gain some insights from how that coverage might reflect the ways that women are still excluded from positions of leadership and power, even though they enter the legal profession and professional life in numbers equal to men, they aren't reflected in equal numbers when you look at whether it's the Supreme Court or any leadership role. So shortlisted comes out of that media study in that one of the thousands of articles we read was an article from the early 1970s and it appeared in the New York Times. And well, I wonder, can I, I'm, can I read just a couple of pages from the, from the introduction? Because it, it includes the story of this article. And this Perfect. is what happens when you, when you start a research project. You don't necessarily expect it to take you in directions like this. But well, let me share a little bit from the introduction. And, and perhaps that'll uh, help everyone understand a little bit more about the beginning of the story. Introduction. Shortlisted. Adjective. Qualified for a position, but not selected from a list that creates the appearance of diversity, but preserves the status quo. As the New York Times reported in 1971, Mildred Lilly fortunately had no children. The article marveled at how she maintained a bathing beauty figure even in her 50s. Lilly was not, however, featured in the news as a swimsuit model. Instead, she was shortlisted. President Richard Nixon had included her among six potential nominees on the list for the United States Supreme Court. At the time, Lily had served as a judge on California courts for more than 20 years. Her resume was as, com as competitive, if not more so, than others on Nixon's list. Lily could have been the nation's first female justice, but she was not chosen. Instead, Nixon claimed to care about diversity, but preserved an all-male court. This book exposes the harms of being shortlisted and offers inspiration for women to chart a path from shortlisted to selected in any career. Stories of women shortlisted for the Supreme Court illuminate how this can be accomplished. Their early successes in a world hostile to women offer excellent guidance for navigating the inequalities that endure in the Me Too world. We share their stories and the collective strategies for moving from shortlisted to selected in the pages that follow. But first, back to the bathing beauty, the Honorable Mildred Lilly. The Times article provoked outrage on the opinion page, even in that era, as one reader observed to the editor, your description of the qualifications of Judge Mildred Lily Lurie, biographical sketches of Supreme Court nominees, October 14th, illustrates the perfectly absurd sexist prejudices to which all women are persistently subjected. Why did you choose to objectify this woman and diminish her accomplishments by including such a totally irrelevant and subjective item? You implied that Judge Lee's body was just as significant as any professional attribute she possesses. There was no discussion of the health, much less the physique, of any of the other possible nominees. Perhaps you could rectify this inequality by printing a discussion of the extent to which Senator Berg retained his schoolboy figure or the manner in which Herschel Friday fills his swimsuit. Barbara B. Martin, sketch of Judge Lilly, New York Times, October 23rd, 1971. The image of Lily in swimwear reflects the sexism of that era and resonates even today as consistent with society's ongoing obsession about the female body. The prevailing sentiment during Lily's time placed men at work and women at home, with minority women often cooking and cleaning for others. Women were largely excluded from the professional class. As articulated by Justice Bradley, concurring in the Supreme Court's decision to deny Myra Bradwell admittance to the Illinois Bar in 1873, the civil law, as well as nature herself, has always recognized a wide difference in the respective spheres and destinies of man and woman. 
Man is or should be woman's protector and defender. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. The constitution of the family organization, which is founded in the divine ordinance as well as the nature of things, indicates the domestic sphere as that which properly belongs to the domain and functions of womanhood. Even as the United States neared its bicentennial, a woman had never occupied a position on the Supreme Court. In fact, women were not supposed to practice law at all. The simple fact that Nixon shortlisted Lilly for the court pushed back against gender norms that dominated the era and still persist. His shortlisting of Lilly is an early example of the very idea this book explores, being sufficiently qualified, but not ultimately selected from a list that creates the appearance of valuing diversity, but preserves the status quo. Nixon faced immense political pressure to place a woman on the court, but personally believed women belonged only in the home. He didn't even think women should be allowed to vote. Shortlisting a woman allowed Nixon to pacify those demanding representation on the court while simultaneously maintaining it as a man's world. But Nixon was not the first president to shortlist a woman and would not be the last. Before Sandra Day O'Connor secured her legacy as the first woman nominated and confirmed to the court in 1981, a handful of presidents formally shortlisted at least nine others for the role. Shortlisted is a project of first impression. We are the first to identify and explore the stories of these women in light of their shared experience of being shortlisted. Until now, their individual and collective stories have largely gone untold. Thank you so much. So that's the story of how it all began. Yeah, that that story and the passion that you put into each word of sharing it really kind of highlights just how Mildred Lilly and her story, I think, um, really ignited something in you that prom promoted you and propelled you to really take this out into the world. And it's um, one of the red threads that I think just kind of came out for me early on as I was reading that is that you picked up on something um, about the tokenism that black and brown women feel throughout these processes even more so um, than women across the board. And um, I appreciated that and it really was something that you were prescient in kind of weaving throughout the entire story and highlighting those additional struggles. And um, I think it kind of culminated, I'm gonna go back to reading a little bit if you don't mind, um, a, a quote from page 190 um, as you're kind of short, uh, kind of um, summing up some of the things for surmounting the shortlist. Um, you pulled on this thread throughout, but then you, you say, until the feminist and women's rights movements account for intersectional experiences of ability, ethnicity, race, religion, sexuality, and more and more meaningful equality in leading in leadership positions will remain elusive. And I think um, that for me, um, it's, you know, very, very well starred, underscored and, um, and highlighted. And I thought that you, you highlighted the many different struggles and the, um, the different elements that women were facing. It was a battle, not only on, um, on the front of, of, um, gender discrimination, but also racial discrimination, um, and so much more. Um, and um, I wondered if you could share a little bit from your own perspective about why that emerged as such a critical theme for you. Yeah, so uh, a, f a few thoughts on that. So first of all, when when we read that story about Mildred Lilly, uh, the reaction I had, you know, was, Who, who's Mildred Lilly? Why have we never heard of her before? She was obviously sufficiently qualified to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. I never learned about her in my history class or even in like a law school class. And, and then the next question was, how many other women were shortlisted for the court before O'Connor? Were there, were there more? And we had no idea what we would find. The research involved going back and looking at some work that other scholars had done, but then also individually going. I, I've been to presidential archives across the country, going all the way back to FDR. And as it turns out, that there are nine women who showed up in an official way on a president's shortlist. Of course, there were many other names that showed up in White House papers that were floated in the media. Uh, but to make it into this study, there had to be either 
an official interview with one of the president's close advisors or the actual literal shortlist, like a piece of paper with handwritten notes. This is back before, um, of course, now President Trump, uh, you can go to whitehouse.gov and see his shortlist, but um, he's the first president to do that. But what was really striking when we found our cohort of nine, there's only one minority woman in the study, Judge Amalia Kearse, who still sits on the Second Circuit. And so again, we didn't set out to find a certain number. It was a, completely a mystery. And as we solved that mystery, one of our first observations was, well, this absolutely reflects what endures today. So um, not only do we not see women in equal numbers and positions of leadership and power, but um, far fewer minority women. And, um, and we felt that the absence of minority women in this study reflects the additional burdens and barriers and hurdles. So that, that's one observation. But then in trying to figure out how to tell this story, it began first as just uh, kind of a, a series of uh, biographies about these nine women because they deserve in their own right to be told. But as we were telling them, we realized, wow, a lot of the things that they went through and the advice that they followed, either that they received or that they gave, sometimes even amongst each other, because some of them actually intersected in their own personal lives, that it uh, was advice that, that was helpful to us as we were navigating our professional life. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that it was advice that I was channeling through to you, it was helpful to you, and that it would be an important part of the story. And so that's really the second half of the book is, gleaning lessons from those lives, but then, or from their lives, but then to really do that in a meaningful way, we had to look back at the history of, of women's rights in this country. And um, at, at each point uh, that you might look at in the feminist movement, you're going back um, even before suffrage, but especially there, um, I remember writing that portion of the book and describing and and having to acknowledge and recognize that Susan B. Anthony, who you know we, we hold out as a champion for our right to vote, we're celebrating the 100 years of women's suffrage, but we also have to acknowledge that she would have sacrificed the minority's right to vote to have the right to vote for white women first. And um, that, I, I, I think that part of what we learned in writing this book is that we saw time and time again if we're, if we're pressing for women's rights, but it's not all women's rights, that compromises the ultimate movement. And so, um, you know, it remains to be seen what's happening right now. And of course, this book was published in May, but written months before uh, um, any of the, not just consciousness raising, but outrage and protesting that we're seeing this incredible moment uh, calling for racial justice in this country. And uh, I'm, I'm ever uh, the optimist. And maybe this will be the time where um, we get it right. Because I do think one of the lessons I learned in writing this book is that as much as um, I want to celebrate and champion, and, and we should, um, the efforts that got women to the point where we are, that often those were led by individuals who were flawed themselves. And that was certainly true of, of um, some of the women in this this. Uh, uh, cohort of shortlisted sisters as well. Absolutely. So I feel like I've gotten to know Mildred Lily a little bit. Um, was there any other shortlisted sister? I like the, I like referring them to, to them as the shortlisted. <laughs> yeah. um, it feels like um, a life raft that we can all grab for. Was there anybody, anybody else who kind of you've taken, you've taken with you or their story is someone you, you've looked to in the past several months, years. I think I, almost as long as I've known you, you've had this project sort of mulling around in your head. <laughs> yeah, it, it has been. Um, you know, it's, it's so hard to pick just one. Okay, so we've touched sure. on Mildred Lily and her, and her bathing beauty, uh, in addition to being a formidable judge uh, on the California courts. Um, I mentioned uh, Amalia Kears, who, um, <sighs> Uh, I, I will just say a couple things about her, but then I'll maybe mention uh, one or two other women. But in addition to Judge Kearse being the only minority woman who is in the study, I think how she finds herself on the Second Circuit is a really important story. And, and again, was a lesson I, and, and, and a story I did not know until I wrote this book. She um, was an extremely successful law student at the University of Michigan, I'm from Michigan, for our, our Michiganders who are watching, and, and literati is in Ann Arbor, so give a, a shout out uh, to Michigan. 
uh, after graduating from law school, an extremely successful partner uh, in New York City at an elite law firm there. Um, you know, really incredible uh, that she was able to do that as a woman, uh, especially as a minority woman. And then she um, is selected as part of when um, President Carter came into office uh, and he's the only president that uh, doesn't have an opportunity to put someone on the Supreme Court during the, the time that, and so the, the first president who is considering women for the Supreme Court goes back to like Hoover and, and Roosevelt really in the 30s. So from the 30s um, forward until 1981 when O'Connor ends up on the court, Carter is the president who absolutely would have put a woman on the court, but there was no vacancy. But here's what he did do. He created a series of commissions around the country with the goal of diversifying the federal judiciary, because when he came into office, he felt that there needed to be more women and minorities. In. They, they were qualified and he um, was concerned that they were not filling judicial roles on the lower courts. And the commissions themselves were diverse in makeup. So they included men and women and minorities. They were charged with interviewing for a potential, potential judicial appointments, a diverse cohort of candidates. And among the qualifications in the selection process was vetting candidates for their commitment to diversity. So not just that you are diverse, but also that you are committed to diversity as a qualification, which I think is a really important takeaway. because That's something that anyone who is in a selection process can bring into their selection process for a position of leadership or power. Importantly, then not Judge Kears, um, but lawyer Amalia Kears was put on one of those commissions. And then after spending some time on the commission selecting and vetting, she was chosen. And that's how she ended up on the second circuit. And but for President Carter making that structural reform. So changing the process by which candidates were vetted I don't think we would have seen a minority woman considered for the Supreme Court at all. And so not only is she considered on the shortlist that President Reagan prepares when he fulfills his campaign promise to put a woman on the court and indeed selects Sandra Day O'Connor, our first female Supreme Court justice, but then she is uh, later considered again by Presidents Bush and Clinton, which I think just um, goes to show how eminently qualified she um, was for the court, the fact that presidents from different parties were looking at her very closely, uh, and, and especially now when the selection process is so politicized, it, it's probably unimaginable to some that presidents from different parties uh, could agree on a potential nominee. Although I, I will say, um, Justice Sotomayor was appointed originally uh, to a lower judicial yeah. court by President Bush and then is selected by Obama. So it wasn't that long ago that presidents from different parties could agree. Uh, but back to your question about other um, women that I'll highlight, I guess um, I'll mention the first woman who showed up on a president's shortlist and that was Florence Allen. So discussed in the Hoover administration and then we found this incredible memo in um, FDR's files where he's considering expanding the U.S. Supreme Court in 1937 because he was unhappy with the Supreme Court's decisions about his New Deal legislation. He was going to add some justices. And amongst this list of names, there's Florence Allen. She was the first female judge elected to the Ohio Supreme Court, the first woman to sit on a federal court of appeals, the Sixth Circuit. When she arrived there, uh, there were no bathroom facilities for her. So uh, the federal government had to fund literally a structural change, like rebuilding the structure of the courthouse so that she would have appropriate facilities. Her male colleagues on the court, some of them on the news that she would be joining them on the bench, fell ill and had to take to bed. This was reported in the news. And they excluded her from lunch. They would not uh, let her join them. They dined in an all-male lunch club. She would heat up uh, soup or her meal on a hot plate that she kept in her chambers. And then the last woman I'll at least mention for now, another Michigan woman, Cornelia Kennedy. Uh, so Cornelia Kennedy uh, began her judicial career um, in Michigan and was elevated to the Sixth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals when Florence Allen was leaving. And when Florence Allen left, uh, one of the gifts she gave to Judge Kennedy 
was that hot plate. And Judge Kennedy kept that hot plate in her office uh, on like a marble pedestal. Although she was eventually able to convince her male colleagues to stop dining at the luncheon club until they would let her in, and which they did. And eventually she was allowed to join them too. That wasn't the first bathroom fight we saw about, <laughs> I don't know if it would be a fight, but the first open fight of needing to have a facility for um, one of the judge or judges or justices, was it? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a common theme. So, um, all, you know, all of these women were entering workplaces that were not prepared for them. They were graduating from, so the, the women themselves could not be more different, um, it, especially in terms of their backgrounds. Uh, some of them were would champion the Equal Rights Amendment. Some of them lobbied against it. You know, they had a whole different, you know, political views, moral views. Uh, some, you know, um, one was an avowed racist. Uh, so all, all kinds of different uh, backgrounds and beliefs, uh, which, I mean, men have had that kind of representation on the Supreme Court for over, you know, hundreds of years. So women, you know, it, it would be wonderful to see more diversity and viewpoints amongst women on the court too. Um, but one thing they, they definitely shared in common, to your point, um, was having to enter a world that was not prepared for them. And uh, so to learn more about the women in this research, uh, we spent time reading oral histories or uh, their articles. And every single one of them uh, had a common experience of going to law school, being one of the very few women in their class, being at the top of their class and being told, I'm sorry, I'd love to hire you. you your resume is great, but we don't have facilities here for women. Like in other words, like they literally didn't have like physical right. facilities for women. <laughs> yeah, I think, um those uh, highlighting those pieces those just the the many different oversights the the tiny from the tiny to the huge that um the shortlisted sisters overcame was just um it, i think for anyone reading i think it really will kind of cause you to to think through some of the different things that you've gone through in your own life and the different things that um kind of pull up um and the different advice you've gotten whether good bad or indifferent right um that all comes back to gender and and how we see um, gender, race, and different marginalizations, for sure. Um, I thought it was one of the, as you talk about Judge Kearse, I thought one of the things that really came to the fore was um, talking um, about her experience, but also the experience that they all shared in, um, in being um, tokens in different ways, having to experience tokenism. And the, I, I thought what really called to me was the discussion about how what a burden that is um it's not only um an indignity but it's it's really a burden for the for folks um and some level even the the process that you're describing this additional um administrative task of go of like supporting the courts um surely is a is an honor to be named to one of those um we it, it, as you navigate a legal career, you have many, many different opportunities to, to serve on committees or uh, um, do those additional things. But all of those come as, as extra tasks. And for folks that are made to be tokens, um, they experience a whole new set of those, serve on this panel to be able to provide some level of diversity. And so um, I, I didn't know if you wanted to add to, add to that as far as um, how your experiences, how that called to your experience or um, experiences you've seen in, the, in, in academia and beyond. No, I think, I think um, that's, so it's, it's absolutely right. And you know, just to keep talking about uh, Judge Kearse for a second, it won't surprise you at all to know that she was the head of her um, hiring committee and diversity initiatives at her law firm before she went to the bench, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I also, I think a lot about, um, so um, part of what we do in the second half of the book, again, is try to reflect on these common themes. And, and one of those is tokenism. And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but Sandra Day O'Connor certainly captured it. So it's not just the extra administrative burden of can you be the face of the organization to show our diversity, but um, just the added pressure that at least she felt, and I think that's probably um, fair to say that all of the women we profile here, and I think um, women often feel, she, she said, um, you know, she felt a lot of pressure being the first woman on the Supreme Court. She definitely didn't want to be the last. In other words, she didn't want to make a single misstep that would, and suddenly, 
she has imposed, and this is true in, in any kind of um, a token um, situation, you know, where someone is um, elevated to create the appearance of, of diversity, that there's this added pressure that suddenly you have to represent everyone from your gender or everyone from your race. And um, also that an organization has checked the box by uh, including that individual. And I think those were um, pieces of, uh, you know, each of these women's lives as they were navigating their own legal careers, but they're all stories that, that resonate now. Um, and and it's, it's not dissimilar to the way these women found a world unprepared for them. Okay, so now um, for the most part, there are uh, bathrooms available for women, but um, there are not necessarily appropriate bathrooms available for everybody who wants them in every way, right? So we're still working on that. We're still working. Um, but, but I think it's also a, a metaphor for the larger uh, concern here, which is, just because it's always been done a certain way doesn't mean it has to be done that way. And when the way it's been done in the past repeatedly excludes minorities or, or women, we need to be rethinking how we do it. If there's a, if there's a structural change that can occur and, and not all of us are going to be president Carter able to issue an executive order, but just to give another example. So another one of the women that I, um, so I will call them my favorite over the course of a conversation about them. But another, another woman that I, I, I really like to tell her story is the second woman shortlisted for the Supreme Court. And she shows up in the Kennedy administration and also with LBJ. And the reason why, uh, her name is Soya Menchikoff. And the reason why is because when she was teaching at the University of Chicago Law School, she was the first female law professor there and also the first female law professor at Harvard Law School. She taught with uh, a man, Nick Katzenbach, who ended up going into the Kennedy administration and LBJ's administration. And he's on the committees that are tasked for vetting candidates. And he keeps pushing Soya Menchikoff forward as having this formidable legal mind. Um, she also just, uh, I, it's not an aside, this is an incredibly important thing, but um, not related to my point. I promise I am getting to the structural change. But she also is the author of the Uniform Commercial Code so especially now when all of us are actually reading the language in contracts because everything's canceled, like, right. um, you know, the contract law is, um, you know, it's, it's fundamental to our way of life. And she, um, as a reporter for the American Law Institute, had the literal hand in drafting that. But she also was the first president of an organization called the Association of American Law Schools. And there's an annual conference of all the law professors every year they go to and and she was the first female president. And she was not, so I mentioned earlier that the, the women in the study had a, a real range of viewpoints and views. And I would say that she, um, she was not described and she would not have described herself as a strong feminist. And she felt that um, women should be allowed to compete, um, but um, was you know, not like a huge proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment or anything like that. Uh, but what she did when she came into her presidency, she noticed that women weren't attending this annual conference. And for law professors, it's kind of important. There's networking that happens there. You might get a job opportunity. Uh, my co-author, Hannah, and I, very early on in our careers, won a writing competition together. Uh, and I think that was another seed that was planted for this book. And, and when she was asking why, it turned out the reason why is because the conference was being held the day after Christmas through New Year. So the holiday period when kids are home from school and if you have any caregiving obligations at all for children or for elderly family, like you can't leave in the middle of the holidays. So she changed when the conference met. She moved it to after the holidays. So just this administrative change yeah. that might like seem like nothing to a lot of people, but is life changing for those of us who are in caregiving situations. And so one thing that learning these women's stories really inspired me to do is to look around the world and ask, are there uh, these sort of low hanging fruit structural changes like the time of a meeting and also maybe some of the bigger picture ones, um, so. No, I think that's incredibly insightful, those kinds of things. And I, it must particularly resound for folks right now 
I think um, as our kind of home and, and um, careers and our home lives really clash and, and come together in ways and maybe blend for some of us and maybe don't blend for some of us in ways that they never have before. I think it kind of um, really shines a light on anybody who's willing and, and employers or institutions that are able to adapt and make that um, more workable for folks. So I think that's incredibly insightful. It's great to know because um, I, don't, I don't think that particular, I, I don't remember that particular story. I was, um, uh, but that, that's really insightful. I think, um, I think it lends itself to the many ways that you highlighted that um, the shortlisted sisters really give us ideas for how to go from shortlisted to selected. And um, one of them being, you know, supporting others and kind of um, forming alliances. Um, what other kinds of, um, what, what other pieces of those would you want to highlight for ways that they taught us to go from shortlisted to selected? Sure. So first of all, I, I will say that this book is definitely not a how to end up on the Supreme Court. So it's not that if you read this book, <laughs> you'll be able to follow this formula and uh, find yourself uh, um, on, on the Supreme Court. A and I also should, should be clear that for most of the women, really, I don't think any of them necessarily aspired, at least not outwardly, for, for the Supreme Court themselves. I mean, what they all aspire to do is to have interesting careers and they found their way to the law in different ways and they repeatedly over and over again didn't take no for an answer but allowed the the passion of their mind to propel them forward in their individual trajectories so um, you know, one of the strategies is, is sort of being inspired by stories like that and um, remembering that one can have mentors who are with us, but we can also very much be mentored by reading these stories and immersing ourselves in, in the stories from women in the past. Um, because even though none of them were selected for the U.S. Supreme Court, each one uh, was repeatedly selected over and over again for positions of leadership and power. On the observation about collaboration, one of the stories I like to tell from the book um, is about a woman named Joan Dempsey Klein. She was also a judge in California, and uh, she sort of um, different than Soya Menchikov. She was very uh, a very strong feminist, very active in setting up organizations for women lawyers, uh, for women judges, and. Um, she finds herself on the shortlist with Sandra Day O'Connor. So for the most part, the shortlists of the presidents leading up to O'Connor have only one woman on them. Uh, Nixon actually had two, you know, Mildred Lilly and a woman named Sylvia Bacon, a judge from D.C. But when you get to Reagan, because Reagan campaigns on putting a woman on the Supreme Court, he has a longer list of, of, of women, all women. He has an all-female shortlist. And that's, that's, I guess, one way to guarantee that a woman is selected if there's only women on the shortlist. And so Joan Dempsey Klein was on that shortlist, along with Sandra Day O'Connor um, and Judge Kearse, as I mentioned, and also Cornelia Kennedy. And uh, Judge Klein, I mean, I, I can't imagine um, the emotions of knowing that you're so close to going on to the Supreme Court she finds out it's not her, it's going to be Sandra Day O'Connor. But she turns around and she goes to O'Connor's confirmation hearings and testifies on her behalf and delivered this really compelling and thoughtful and beautiful testimony in support of O'Connor and really uh, collaborating to help O'Connor compete for that role. And so that was another sort of insight we drew. And then, of course, the structural change piece, I think, again, you know, whether you're the president issuing the executive order or not, there are lessons to be learned from Carter's decision to make um, not just the pool of candidates diverse, but an actual qualification, one's commitment to diversity. That was a, a, a very profound takeaway. Uh, and then one, one more I'll mention, and... Um, it relates to someone we haven't mentioned yet, but there's a Michigan tie here. So President Ford, Gerald Ford, uh, filled uh, seats on the Supreme Court. He shortlisted uh, for one of those seats, both uh, 
Cornelia Kennedy and uh, Carla Hills. Carla Hills was his secretary for housing and urban development. She had been a lawyer in California prior to that. And he, in her oral history, she talks about very briefly uh, that he asked her, would she consider the Supreme Court? And she said, no, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. And so we decided to call that self shortlisting. Mm. And um, not, not to say that, you know, every woman has to take every offer she gets for a position of leadership and power. But uh, we did wonder, and it was really, you know, um, true for each of these women. And part of the, the book reflects on this. Is what would the world look like if one of these women had ended up on the court? And so, of course, we had to wonder, well, what would the world have looked like if Carla Hills had been on the Supreme Court uh, as a Ford nominee rather than self-shortlisting? And so we, we encourage, as, as part of our conclusion, for women to think really carefully before they take themselves out of the running for a, a position of leadership and power. And I think that's an important lesson to be drawn as well. Do you remember any of the things that you mused might be a little bit different? It's hard. It's impossible to know what um, any precise ones, or what exactly would have happened. I remembered um, some of the different, some of the different decisions around, um, around um, the, I think even the Casey decision and many, many different decisions that, and that may have been just, just a little different if there were more people, um, the Ledbetter decision um, and, yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a few things to think about. Like, what would the court, you know, like, what would it, what, what would the outcomes of decisions be? Like, that's certainly, you know, a discussion we can have. And, and what cases might have been selected and would really? certain cases have been selected sooner rather than later, you know, because you don't need the whole court to agree to grant sure. cert, right? Um, to give you four. Um, so if we had the like, four women on there, um, you know, but, but even if it's, you know, and we can, we can guess and we can conjecture, but even if we don't know for sure how a particular woman would have decided a case, and, and some of the women in this study um, would, and a question I'm often asked is, you know, so wouldn't it be better to have a court that's filled with people who are committed to women's rights as feminists, whether they are men or women? And, and I mean, I mean, yes, I wanna see women's rights advanced, but I also think that it's really important that women are able to represent a diverse array of viewpoints, just like men have represented a diverse array of viewpoints in public life. And we don't, we don't see that same, same parity. And so, um, you know, if, if the nine women that appear in a shortlisted formed the U.S. Supreme Court, um, I, you know, maybe the decisions would have come out kind of similarly because they had, you know, really? very different views. But, but I, I think that we can absolutely say that if a woman had been in that prominent public role going back to the 1930s, when we think about Florence Allen, that mm -hmm. the, the presence of women in public life would have been much more accepted and advanced more quickly if we had seen a woman in that role. One of my favorite quotes comes not from a Supreme Court justice, but from former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. And she um, has, has said this in speeches many times that she was asked, you know, did you imagine that as a child you would be Secretary of State? And she was like, well, no, because I've never seen him wearing a skirt. And it's, it's a joke, but it's not really a joke. And, it, and, and it, it's true. It's, it's, it's very difficult to dream and aspire and then concretely work for a position if you've never seen someone who reflects who you are in that role. And so I think absolutely having um, a woman on the court in the 1930s would have done a lot, not just for the makeup of the court and the outcome of decisions from the Supreme Court, but frankly, the makeup of professional life for women um, around the world. I couldn't agree more. I think um, one of the quotes that you pull um, from Justice Sotomayor um, talks about how she never would have dreamed of being on the Supreme Court because that's um, sort of a way out their dream, right? It's not a the shortlisted um, to selected guideposts aren't necessarily um, how you become part someone on the Supreme Court. However, Justice Sotomayor said, that, but experience has taught me that you cannot value dreams according to the odds of their coming true, 
their real value is in stirring within us the will to aspire. And I think that's what this book really does a lot. So I, I'm deeply grateful. Um, I wanted to just nod that um, we do have the ability to ask questions. So I don't have to be the only one asking questions. If anyone <laughs> has questions, please do put them in, your, in the chat because this is a great opportunity to draw on a lot of great wisdom. Um, I'll pull we do up. have a, a few uh, questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see them. Oh, no, no. Uh, they were sent to me privately. We have the oh, chat right. close. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, great. Well, the first one is a two parter, um, and it's. Um, are there stories or pieces of this book that were especially hard for you and Hannah to experience or bring together into the book? Uh, and the second part of that is, are there any elements you had to eliminate for whatever reason that you wish you could have left in? Oh, um, so on the first question, um, were there parts that were hard to bring into the book? Um, so, and I don't know exactly what uh, is meant by hard, um, so I'll answer it in a few different ways. Um, first of all, it was hard to write this book going through the tenure stream for both of us uh, because it isn't necessarily the traditional uh, kind of writing project. So it's always been um, almost more like a, a hobby. So it took us a long time to get it done because we were both pursuing our professional life also. So it was hard in that way. Um, at times it was hard to write uh, because it meant traveling to obscure places to dig through presidential archives or the archives of these women. And so it meant, um, you know, leaving kids behind to make that happen. Um, and then sometimes it was hard, maybe this is what was meant by hard, sometimes it was hard to write because um, we had to think about our own experiences, like what we ha have gone through. And and um, not, not to say that, I mean, you know, Hannah and I are definitely beneficiaries of the roads that these women paved. But it was at times um, a bit heartbreaking to read things that happened to them and have to acknowledge that that happened to us too. And so, um, you know, we both were paid less than men for doing the same jobs and had to raise that issue with our employers. Um, so we didn't have to, um, you know, face the same barriers exactly, but we've faced enough and I think um, the last piece that was you know hard I'll, I'll say was having to acknowledge that um, so 1992 the year of the woman everyone might remember Time Magazine heralded it that way that's when um, I was graduating from high school and I totally bought into that I was like okay like here I am like I could just you know go work really hard and um, the hard work will be acknowledged and uh, one thing that was hard about writing this book was having to accept and realize that there's a lot of work that remains. And then also to have to acknowledge that as a white woman, I will never understand the way um, a woman of color or minority woman has to go through this world. But I recognize the history and and so all of that was hard to, to write about in the book and to try to um, to figure out how to do it in um, in the the right way that paid respect to these women and also pays respect to the women and men that we hope will read the book and learn the lessons and and dream big with us about um, how the next wave of feminism or rights for women and minorities um, won't be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, um, us reflecting back that we didn't do enough this time. Um, so the cutting room floor part of that question, and yes, so much information about these women's lives. Um, so, so many details. And um, we tried to keep the best that highlighted uh, each of them the most for who they are. Uh, there's lots of juicy details about love lives and, and um, the, you know, uh, growing up childhood stories from the women. And we tried to just include the, the best nuggets. But our, our hope also in writing this book and sort of one of the concluding calls is that it will inspire other people to research more about these women's lives and also tell more of these untold stories. And we're, we're seeing it happen in other fields beyond law, but um, anyone who picks up this book and reads it, 
um, hopefully we've given you just enough to see that there's so much more yet to be written. And um, some of that's on my cutting room floor. So uh, let me know, I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, but a lot of it is uh, on pages that um, are not yet written, but I hope will be. Thank you. And the other question we have is for both Renee and Eleanor. Um, you are both such accomplished lawyers. What lessons do you take from this book for your own careers and lives? Hmm. Do you want to go first? Or maybe <laughs> oh, that's um, the journey of being an attorney for me has been such a fun one and such an interesting one um, that has never had a particular destination that was necessarily in mind. So that's a really, using the word accomplished really is um, humbling. But um, being at the Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence is um, a dream, I think for me really, like I wouldn't have even thought that this particular career existed. So I think what I've been learning and I think what Renee, um, Renee and Hannah both um, taught me um, without, ever necessarily saying it quite out loud was, although I think Renee has at least said it out loud a couple times, um, that doing what you, what is going to make you want to look in the mirror every morning and go to work and get up every day is so much more important than anything else. And what this book really, um, each of the little pieces um, inspired me, I think knowing that our struggles are common struggles, the um, one of the stories that really just shocked me um, was that Judge Kennedy, Judge Cornelia Kennedy, who was on the Sixth Circuit when I had a chance to clerk um, on that circuit and made a habit to bring female law clerks um, into her chambers and, and sort of provide extra networking opportunities, um, that when she was on the shortlist, um, she actually served a dinner to President Reagan and cooked the, I think it was a salmon mousse and um, was in, and that was days after a hysterectomy in her experience. And um, so our struggles are common struggles, things that you can identify um, that are like, I can't believe I'm trying to wedge all of these different things into one um, moment. I, the days during COVID when I'm litigating a case with um, my kids kind of trying to keep my kids out of the view of the camera somehow. Um, those are common struggles that people can, um, that we, we're not building on um, something that on a blank slate. But also that, um, that concept of self shortlisting, I think really spoke to me because there are so many chances right now. I mean, we're all tired, right? <laughs> um, we've all, there's moments throughout your career where it's just, um, it, it is really challenging. But the, the ways that trying to put yourself out into the universe and make the universe different for what you have to contribute is more important than you might think. So I, I think that that's what it taught me. Um, but that was actually a question that I really wanted to ask Renee was how studying these, um, these women and their decisions really impacted her. So I'm glad somebody else asked it too. So I'll, there's, there's a lot I could say here. Um, one sort of drill down story, um, getting to know Soya Menchikoff, who I mentioned earlier, um, first female law professor at the University of Chicago, among other places. For, for me, um, she went from being a portrait on the wall that I walked past when I was a law student and to get nothing in common with her. To now, <laughs> I feel like she's one of my closest friends, even though I never had the privilege of meeting her, but she was still alive. And so the lesson for me was that it's so important. There's, um, it's so important to absorb and learn the history of um, the women who have carved up the uh, paths before us. But the sort of bigger takeaway I would say from writing the book is um, one of the first is the first strategy that we conclude with at the end of lessons we can take from these women's lives. And in some ways, this seems really obvious. But the more I have thought about it. For me, the more profound it is, and I think it wraps very much into this question about the two of us both being lawyers. All of these women went and obtained law degrees because it, for different reasons, they felt that they were not being treated equally, that they were not viewed the same as men. 
And they felt that going and getting their law degree would give them equal footing. For some of them, it meant not just being treated equally based on gender, but also because of their socioeconomic background or other, other pieces to it. And they, they saw pursuing law as a path for them personally to experience equality and justice, and also as a tool to um, bring that to society. And that has been true for me. And um, I'm a first generation lawyer. No one in my family is a lawyer. And I think, I, my I hope is that um, that's a, a, a gift that I'm sharing with all of the law students that I have taught over the years, which is now thousands. Um, and it's been such a gift to be able to have this conversation with one of those um, students, um, with Ellie. Uh, in part because as her professor, she still was also inspiring and helping lay the seeds for this project and the work that she did with um, my co-author, uh, Hannah, and me. And um, as I said at the outset of this, putting together that law review symposium back at Michigan State, I think in what, 2012. So uh, everything comes full circle. And that's definitely been true in this project. Well, thank you. Um, we've come to the top of the hour. Um, and so I just wanted to take this opportunity again to thank Renee Jefferson and Eleanor Jordan for such an inspiring and powerful, wide ranging conversation about shortlisted women in the shadows of the Supreme Court. I'm putting the link one more time in the chat. If you need to purchase your copy, you can do so through Literati Bookstore. Um, Renee, Eleanor, thank you again so much for joining us at our At Home with Literati virtual series. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You. Thanks, everybody. Take care and be safe, and we'll Bye. see you at the next event. Thank you.